This week on the agenda, the skyline is the limit. What China's rampant urbanization means for global economic development. Of the world's 100 largest cities, more than a quarter are in China. It's a nation that's urbanizing fast. In 1980, about 20% of the population lived in a city. By 2020, it was more than 60%, and soon it'll likely hit 70%. Rapid urbanization has been a primary policy in China. Improved transport links and housing have given millions of people access to better healthcare, education, and of course, jobs. Poverty rates have fallen, while at the same time, the economy has boomed. 45 years ago, China's GDP was more than $178 billion. Last year, it was about $18 trillion. But there are some issues. The denser a population becomes, the more burden there is on the climate. More cars on the road means more air pollution, and providing power to huge populations has led to increasing use of fossil fuels. But China is working to solve these problems, running numerous low-carbon programs across the country. And the gap between peak carbon use and net zero in China is set to be the shortest in history. Joining me now are Dr. Yan Song, Director of the Program on Chinese Studies and a Professor at the University of North Carolina's Department of City and Regional Planning, and Chris Hamnett, Professor of Geography at King's College London and a specialist in urbanization. Um, Dr. Song, let, let's start with you. How has China really benefited from urbanization? Uh, China's GDP per capita has increased, I think, more than tenfold since the uh, 1980s, uh, with much of its growth uh, driven by urbanization. Uh, cities such as in Shenzhen has become the major economic hubs, um, attracting investment, creating a lot of jobs, um, and um, becoming sort of a major um, uh, economic hub in, in the world. Um, and also, the other, another benefit is to increase productivity uh, for the country. Uh, as more people move to cities, uh, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, concentration of uh, great skills and um, entrepreneurs, and this could uh, lead to a development of new industries and technologies. Um, and um, for, for example, again, uh, in, in the tech industry in China, uh, it has uh, flourished as an as a, um, outcome of urbanization. Uh, the digital economy in China now is just amazing. Um, worth of over five trillion U.S. dollars, I believe, and then mostly in, uh, concentrated in urban areas. Um, and also, I think another benefit is uh, improved living standards. Um, urbanization has brought access to uh, many urban amenities, which people can enjoy more than before. Healthcare, education, um, transportation, parks, arts, museums um, that you can, you can uh, uh, think of. And all of this has happened so far. So, pr Professor, I mean, what, what do you think is unique about China's urbanization? I think the urbanization process in China is uh, absolutely astonishing. It's uh, one of the fastest, if not the fastest, and it's absolutely the biggest process of urbanization in terms of the numbers of people and the uh, size and the number of numbers of cities, uh, which really has ever taken place, I think, in, in human history. Also, I would add, one of the key elements here, of course, has been the role of the Chinese government, of, of the state. So I think a lot of urbanization which has taken place in China has been, uh, certainly in broad terms, uh, state-led or state-directed. So let's talk, though, about managing the, the speed of urbanization. Um, Yan Song, what, what strategies have China put in place? Um, China has implemented uh, uh, quite a few strategies to manage the speed um, 
as well as the impact of urbanization. Uh, the uh, first one that that uh, we can we can uh, discuss is the uh, old school hookah system. Uh, so the hookah system is a household registration system, um, and it is designed to control migration from rural to urban areas. Um, and uh, um, the government in recent years has relaxed some of the restrictions uh, to allow more people to move to cities. Uh, nevertheless, it has been useful in managing the speed um, of urbanization in China. But most recent years, the, um, uh, the transition to governance, such as um, using comprehensive system of urban planning, to, uh, uh, to, to guide the development of the cities by setting up specific targets in terms of uh, the size of the cities, the density of the cities, the population um, density, right? And then also the uh, um, sort of the, the, uh, the, land, um, the land amount of the cities that they can grow. Um, and another policy is the uh, infrastructure investment the uh, Chinese government has invested heavily in infrastructure, including highways, airports, high-speed rails to uh, um, support and to manage the growth of cities, making easier, much easier for people to move around um, and to uh, help connect cities and uh, regions. And of course, economic policies have been put in place um, yeah, to, uh, to help the growth of uh, smaller cities as well, not only just focusing on the uh, major cities. But while there's all of this building going on, I, I'm, I'm worried about environmental degradation. I mean, Chris, urbanization is inevitably going to have an impact out there. So how do you think China's balancing that urban expansion while at the same time protecting the planet? That's a very good question. I think uh, it's certainly in the earlier decades, I would suggest that China really put uh, most of the emphasis on economic growth and on urban growth. And I think the, of course, one of the consequences of that is that there has been a very marked uh, outward expansion of the cities and the um, the removal or the transformation of a very great deal of um, agricultural land, very fertile agricultural land, because of course a lot of the city growth has taken place on the, uh, uh, the, the, the as it were, the, the flatter, more level areas, certainly in the case of the Pearl River Delta or, or Shanghai or, or Chengdu. So the, the outward growth of the cities has had a big impact. I think another big problem uh, has been that the, in in some cases, the the outward expansion has not been uh, concentrated enough, and that there's been a lot of, as it were, new peripheral settlements and cities outside the major cities, with a very high degree of um, backwards and forwards commuting between them. So I, my fear here is that this has actually created um, very high levels of um, uh, d d daily transport movement, which obviously generates a, a huge amount of, um, of pollution. That said, uh, I think what has happened in the last couple of decades is the dramatic expansion of the subway system in many of the major Chinese cities. So uh, Beijing, Shanghai, each have about 15 subway lines, and many of the other cities uh, are adding subway lines at a very, very rapid pace. So the, I think the government realized that they have to try to shift uh, some of the people traveling from road to uh, public transport. And, and that's, uh, that will be a very, very beneficial outcome if they manage that. I know you're talking about the subway, but I can't help thinking about how the skylines of some of these cities have completely changed. Beijing and Shanghai come to mind, some of the world's biggest cities. How difficult is it, Yang Song, to, to manage mega cities like this? Yeah, managing mega cities is a significant challenge. Uh, the sheer number of people in the mega cities, such as in Beijing and Shanghai, 
makes it really difficult to provide just the basic services such as uh, affordable housing, health care, um, and um, um, to implement policies and regulations effectively. And Professor ben, uh, Hamlet just mentioned the traffic, right? Uh, the compu uh, commuting or, or excessive commuting in, in the cities. Uh, as you can imagine with uh, large populations, traffic congestion is a significant problem in Chinese mega cities. This not only affects quality of life, but also has some uh, economic implications. And, and of course, um, Chinese mega cities are also grappling with uh, environmental degradation problems such as air pollution, um, car, uh, sort of uh, the, uh, the tail type emissions from cars, um, and many of the other environmental issues. But I, I want to emphasize the uh, social inequality perspective of uh, mega cities. Um, in the bigger cities, you would typically see that uh, the wealthy people and the poor residents living side by side. And this makes extremely difficult to implement policies that would benefit all residents. Um, so it it's, um, really requires much more effective governance, um, but it's, it's really challenging just due to the uh, complexity and fragmentation um, of uh, the, uh, the government structure in uh, China, uh, just as, as well in, in the world. It's interesting, you're talking about the divide within the mega cities, but Professor Hamner, I wonder if you could talk about the, the, the divide there is between um, rural um, China and urban China. It, it's a very major divide, uh, although I think probably it has reduced in recent uh, decades. Uh, I can remember very, very well some of my early visits to China and uh, outside of the cities, the rural areas, uh, the, the degree of, uh, of poverty was very high. The living standards were very, very poor. And um, urban workers uh, at that stage were going back now to the uh, late 1980s, early 90s. And you would see them at the railway stations in the big holidays taking televisions or even refrigerators on their backs onto the trains to get uh, to take them to the rural areas to to put into the villages etc um, all of that in a sense has now completely changed except for some of the perhaps much more remote uh, rural areas in some of the more distant uh, provinces and, and I think what we've been seeing is a process of diffusion of urbanization. So it's not just the big cities. And China now has got more than a, a hundred cities with more than um, a million people. And I think there's probably got um, eight, nine cities with, with 10 million people or more. But what we're seeing is in the wider urban areas, the smaller cities are growing. And beyond that, the the, the small towns are also growing rapidly, and they've they've all been basically sucking in uh, workers, uh, residents from the the rural areas. So I would probably say that the urbanisation process in China is one that, broadly speaking, has lifted not all boats, but lifted most boats, e even though some boats will not have been lifted uh, very much, but it's, it's had a, a huge impact and an improvement, I think, on living standards uh, across China as prosperity has diffused outwards from the big city. So, Professor Hamnett, I, I wonder, do you think that China is going to continue on this path, to continue to urbanise and, and to continue to do it so rapidly? I think it's going to continue urbanizing, little doubt of that. And I think the Chinese government um, wants that and wants to encourage it because uh, urbanization has been such a key part of economic growth and particularly the, um, the role of residential development, the vast number uh, of, of new apartment buildings which have been um, constructed in recent decades. This has all been a key element of, of economic growth, sucking in raw materials, iron, steel, etc. But I think in 
the, the, the fastest part of the urbanization process is now probably behind us. And I think inevitably, now that urbanization level is up to 60%, it's likely to begin to, to slow down um, sim simply because the, 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 the size of the rural population, uh, many of whom, of course, have moved to the cities, has begun to, to reduce and to reduce quite dramatically. So uh, I think what we've seen is um, uh, a very compressed, condensed process of urbanization and I think probably it's going to slow in the next uh, 10 or 20 years. That's, that's a guess. That certainly is a yes. Well, Chris Hamlet, Yang Song, absolute pleasure talking to both of you. Fascinating stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Still to come here on the agenda. Is the world ready for another wave of urbanisation? As China embarks on a new journey of modernisation, the National People's Congress, China's top legislature, and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, the top political advisory body, convene their annual sessions in early March. Join us on CGTN for our special coverage of the two sessions. Find out the course China will take to ensure a sustainable future for its 1.4 billion people and how China's decisions will impact global economic recovery. Agenda for 1.4 billion on CGTN. Welcome back to the agenda. We've heard how China's urbanization has progressed, but what about the rest of the world? Joining me now is Alain Berthaud, senior fellow at New York University's Maron Institute of Urban Management. Thanks ever so much, sir, for coming on the agenda. Now, I want to know why you think that cities who embrace rapid urbanization will be the most successful. Well, because you know, cities, uh, strangely enough, the larger our cities when labor markets are integrated, the more productive and innovative they are. You know, uh, all of us uh, have always a feeling that cities are difficult to manage. Uh, they all have a problem of transport, congestion, uh, pollution. But in spite of that, uh, if you look at the results, uh, People are more productive in large cities, in large conurbation, uh, in large metropolis. And by the way, China is innovative there with uh, cluster cities, which reach uh, you know level of urbanization which has never been seen before. So people have been voting with their feet all over the world. Uh, planners, by the way, didn't plan those cities. Uh, they it's uh, people moving to those cities would in fact oblige the planner to plan for them. So what makes a, a strong urban space or, or town? What are the things that planners should be focusing on? Well, uh, really, it's, it's a people who go to those cities will make a strong town. You know, the, uh, the, the, a very efficient sewer system or even transport system in itself doesn't make a city. It's, you know, you go to a city because of the quality of the people who are there. So. Uh, Planners, in, in fact, have to make a city which is as hospitable as possible to newcomers. This means two things. Uh, linking transport and housing affordability. You know, these are the two major things which unfortunately are very often studied uh, separately as if they were two separate fields. In fact, uh, housing and transport are, you know, two faces of the same coin. And I think that, that to me, maybe a bit of the problem in many cities. And the problem of affordability, you know, housing affordability prevents some people from moving to cities where they will be the most efficient and the more productive. So I think this is a problem uh, that we have to solve. And it affects, uh, in a certain way, maybe more uh, richer city than poorer cities, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's it. And I think that it's mostly caused by uh, bad planning, you know, 
too many regulation in, in some area and not enough in other area. I want to talk to you about that because you, you mentioned the important things like mobility and affordability, but there are considerations like pollution, sustainability, and as you mentioned, regulation. I, I think you said a thousand things that cities need to do to cope with urbanisation, all of those things that might in fact slow things down. That's right. You see, that there is no silver bullet. You know, there is not one thing you can do which will make a, a city successful. There are, as you say, hundreds or maybe more than hundred things that they have to do at the same time. But uh, you know, they uh, they have absolutely to to allow more housing and more diverse housing to be built. And most of the regulation we have prevents things from happening. You know, or oblige. Uh, people to use more land or more floor space than they will want. You know, if you have a, a minimum uh, apartment size, for instance, it means that uh, the regulation force you to uh, to consume more floor space than than you will want. Uh, if you have a maximum density, this is the same thing. Uh, if you know, in the 19th century, there were uh, some reason to. Uh, you know, to regulate densities in Edmonds because uh, technology were not, uh, you know, able to serve very high density. Now, uh, our technology can serve any density possible. So let us, uh, uh, you know, let us people again vote with their feet, even within the city. And when there is a high demand for, for land and floor space, uh, you know, it's, it's necessary then to develop the infrastructure will serve that. The infrastructure will be, be much cheaper than the land uh, that is unused because of, uh, uh, you know, infrastructure has not been developed. You talk about how technology changes things um, and has changed things, and, and also that the costs as technology advances, sometimes it gets cheaper. But to what extent do you think that some cities are relying too much on outdated technology or outdated patterns of investment, you know, traditional policies that you know, are geared towards preventing change rather than encouraging it? Uh, most cities, I, I have conclusion, most cities uh, have, the, their regulation are in fact to slow down change. And I think there is a, it's, it's not that planners are stupid. It's because I think that people who already live in cities and have a successful life in a city uh, do not want change. And I think politicians are, in a way, uh, reacting to that. Uh, you see that in, in New York, in particular, uh, you know, not, not talking into, taking into account now the, the crisis with the COVID, but say that all the regulations which are there are to slow down as soon as you have a uh, you know, the project of a new skyscraper with houses, with apartments, uh, there are several lawsuits against it, saying, well, it's not in the spirit of the neighborhood or something like that. So there is, a, 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 unfortunately, a strong, what, what people call a NIMBY, you know, a NIMBY movement in cities which are successful, strangely enough. So NIMBY being, of course, not in my backyard. No. <laughs> but let's, right. let's yes, look yes. at the impact that China's rapid urbanization is having on the rest of the world. Um, what impact do you think it's having? Uh, well, it's an example of uh, developing infrastructure very fast and very efficiently. Uh, you know, I start working in China, in urban China, in 83. My first visit was in 83. And and uh, so I have followed this development. I mean, it, it was astonishing how fast China developed its infrastructure. You know, one example that I give in my book is Pudong, for instance. Uh, you know, when I, I start working in Shanghai, Pudong was was a swamp. You know, there were some rice paddies, some some warehouses, and uh, the development of Pudong really uh, require a lot of bridges, uh, tunnels, and uh, and a fast uh, moving transit system, subway, which didn't exist. Uh, they, the government built all that in about 20 years, let's say. Uh, the, the subway of Shanghai now is much longer than the one in New York, and they did that in a, in a fraction of the time that uh, was necessary. So I think that that, in a way, is an example where maybe I'm a little more critical of urbanization in China is 
when they expanded in the suburb, I think they had a tendency to give a contract, you know, for a develop, you know, development right to very large developers instead of uh, trying to keep, let's say, to to have a more diverse supply system. And I think that that's a bit maybe the 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 problem in the real estate in in China now. Uh, too many uh, very large developers, not enough small or, or medium-sized developers. So lots of people talk about China. They also talk about India. But what about Africa? I, and how is, is that going to drive the future of urbanization? So Africa has a big advantage on every other continent because of this young population. But then Africa, uh, the problem with Africa is, of course, uh, very deficient infrastructure. If you see a, a city like Lagos, for instance, it, it is uh, nearly as large as Shanghai, but it has a, a small fraction of the infrastructure, uh, you know, water supply, sewage, storm drainage, transport. And I think that the, the ability of, uh, of the, the, the African cities to develop uh, their infrastructure depends, I mean, on political situation, which is sometimes a little unstable. So I am not so sure if they, I, I hope that they will solve this problem. Another aspect in, in Africa also is the fragmentation of uh, artificial borders. You know, if you look at the, the part which is maybe uh, um, developing the most uh, urban, you know, if you take a, a line between Lagos and Abidjan, you, you have a, a, a long stretch here of nearly, nearly continuous urbanization but you have a number of frontiers there, and the frontiers are not necessarily very friendly. No, I mean, there is no hostility, yeah. mm, but mm. say, uh, there is a bureaucratic barrier to, to, uh, to, to transport. Which periods of development within a city do you consider to be good examples of urban development? You know, uh, each city is different, so it, uh, I, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, there is a lot of cultural aspect to, uh, probably, you know, one of the best, the, the city which has developed the most spectacularly and most efficiently have been Singapore. You know, the Singapore, they, they monitor very quick, very quickly what what is happening. If they see a problem and they, they have identified some as they develop, they immediately modify their policies so to, uh, you know, to, to correct this problem. So that's, uh, but of course, Singapore is relatively small. You know, it's a city state. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's relatively small. It uh, you know it's only six and a half million people. So you know if you compare to to Shanghai or the the Pure River Delta, I mean the yeah. the Greater Bay Area. Greater Bay Area now has about 90 million people. You know it's a, it's a, a larger than Germany in a square of about 130 kilometer by 130 kilometer. You know this, this again, it's not a completely you know, integrated labor market, but it's on its way of being integrated. You know, I, since uh, I remember my first visit to Shenzhen in uh, 1984, and uh, I mean, it's absolutely astonishing the way they have managed to link uh, not only Shenzhen, but all the cities of the Delta yeah. together with infrastructure. And that makes, of course, uh, their, yeah. their, you know, their unique uh, productivity and innovation. Alan Batar, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out At The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming up on a future agenda, marching towards modernization, we'll unpack everything from China's annual two-session summit. But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all of the Agenda team here in London, goodbye. <laughs>